how do you stop a man or a woman who constantly goes to the gym, works out hard, like goes to battle with themselves and their inner demons every single day, when they face any kind of adversity in relationships, in life, because death happens and, and unfortunately bad events happen, those people that go to battle every day and work out hard are more likely to deal with the unfortunate situations of life. Totally. Better, right? Totally. And so that's why we stress the fitness factor first. And we found that if we stress the fitness factor first, it kind of bleeds into other areas of their life. So everyone was like, hey, I'm gonna dial in my fitness first because I could only help others to the point that I can help myself. So you have a passion for fitness and the desire to start your own business, but launching a massively successful fitness business is extremely complex. The systems, operations, hiring, firing, coaching, sales, and marketing are critical to success. Where do you even start? This show will give you the answers. Here is Bedros Koulian and Bryce Henson, your hosts of the Fitness Franchise Podcast, a show dedicated to helping fitness entrepreneurs launch and grow successful gyms. Hey, welcome back, friend, to another amazing episode of the podcast. And here in the studio with my man B. And today we are talking about the high performance summit that uh, we launched at the end of June. I should say we, meaning Bedros and Wes Watson. So we're here to talk about the what, the why, desired outcome. And really, I'm going to pass it over to B. And then for me, I'm going to be, be a story tell a little bit on my opening keynote and some takeaways that I think can provide you a lot of value in your business experience journey. So B, talk to us, my friend. Well, you know, we decided to do the high performance summit because um, the pandemic of 2020 really got a lot of people isolated, got a lot of people in a state of anxiety and depression went through the roof. And when you think about it, things like depression, anxiety, worry, fear, doubt, all those uncertainty, all those emotions create lower vibration. Like they use a, uh, I think it's called a hertz meter and they could measure your vibration frequency and negative emotions like for example uh, uh shame and guilt are the twoest two lowest vibrating frequencies that they can measure and then all the way to the very top is like uh, gratitude gratitude enlightenment and happiness have like some like seven thousand units of measure versus like 20 or 30 units of measure for uh um guilt and shame. And so uh, ironic thing about that is too, when you look at, there's a pyramid uh, that I'll send you that has all the hurts on different, based on emotions. Acceptance is two thirds of the way up. Acceptance is like 400 in terms of measurement, mm -hmm. right? So if you're feeling some level of guilt about something, if you just accept that guilt, okay, I've, I accept it and I'm gonna do things differently in the future so I don't have that guilt, just acceptance puts you at a higher vibration level. But all this to say that Wes Watson and I are big fans of helping people become their highest self. And sorry to interject, but and for those of you who don't know Wes, can you maybe tell a little bit about him? Yeah, Wes Watson is an interesting cat because, uh, and if those of you want to do a Google search with uh, my name, Bedros and Wes, on Google or YouTube, you're gonna find a, a two-part YouTube video where I interviewed him. It just went viral and blew up. Wes was a, uh, he almost became a professional snowboarder and skateboarder in his late teens, early 20s. Got involved in San Diego in just small-time drug dealing, marijuana. Ended up doing it on a very high scale. And as a byproduct of the complications of that world of breaking the law, went to prison for 10 years. 10? 10, 10 years, years. Into federal prison. Yeah. His first three years in prison, he was upset at the man, he was upset at the system, he was upset at everything except himself. Something happened towards the end of the third year in prison where he goes, you know what, I think I need to stop looking at the world through this glass that I see as a window and pointing to everyone out there as the problem. And I need to treat this piece of glass as a mirror. And the problem is here. He spent the next seven years of his 10 year sentence. His, actually his sentence was longer. I think it was like 14 or 15 years, but with good behavior, et cetera, he was out in 10 years. And he spent the next seven years literally helping drug addicts, 
because uh, apparently there's plenty of drugs still in the prison system. That's what he told me. I was yeah. blown away. Mm -hmm. Helping drug addicts get off of drugs and turn to enlightenment and meeting their higher self and having a state of living in a state of gratitude. Got these guys to start working out regularly and really changed their energy, their physical state. And as he did that, he found himself holding himself more accountable to all those things because he somehow became the leader, the shaman of the prison system, right? Now, Wes, he will tell you this in person and, and you know anyone that sees him on YouTube for 20 seconds knows that he is very loud and violent, but he leans towards now enlightenment, enlighten, enlightenment and service to others and gratitude. And so seeing how 2020 was just cast of this giant blanket of despair on the world, he and I decided that we're going to, now that he's out and about, he coaches people on their health, fitness, mindset, and positive mental attitude. Um, he and I connected and decided that we're going to run the High Performance Summit, a two-day event that sold out very quickly, where we were just going to pour into the audience on how to increase their vibration and really dial in their, not only their financial state, but their physical state, their mental state, their emotional state to become the person that they're meant to be. Like we're all meant to be someone. You're not born as the higher level Bryce. I'm not born as the higher level Bedros. We become our higher level through adversity and suffering and life experiences and how we react and respond to them and then holding ourselves accountable to the idealized version of the person that we want to be. And so the idea of the High Performance Summit came up and we did it and et cetera, et cetera sold out and we spent two days just pouring into the audience and man to see how people shifted this is proof that the human psyche can shift within 48 hours like it's not a gosh you know it took me months to develop a habit people have texted me since now we were like almost three weeks out and reached out to me and said like you don't understand my whole morning routine has completely changed. I wake up early. I have a morning routine. My life has become predictable and predictability leads to profitability in not only money, but in health and mindset and emotions. And I love getting those messages, man, because if we can raise the global vibration and frequency, then the earth itself is a better place to live for all of us. Oh, love that. Right? Love that. Yeah. Dude, man, I was grateful and honored to for you asked me to give the opening oh keynote. God. And yeah. Um, yeah, I had a great time with it and figured a good opportunity. And this this particular show, I don't, I've told my story, but um, I'll kind of reiterate a few of the high level mm -hmm. points and then give you three takeaways that I think it's super valuable if you're a fitness business owner, if you want to be a fitness bi business owner, if you're a Fit Body Bootcamp soon to be owner um, that will help you on your journey. And, and I started, to, you know, my story. Story. Um, I've lived in Southern California for, for 17 years now. I'm definitely more Californian than I am, um, you know, other parts of the country. But originally, I'm from the Midwest, and the Midwest is a great place, amazing people, not the fitness capital of the world. Mm. So there I was, 21 years old, the latter part of my teens and early adulthood. Uh, fast food and Taco Bell was a staple in my diet, and I got an internship position, which turned into a full-time job in Los Angeles, California, in 2004. And LA, the beaches, the sunshine, the palm trees, the blue sky everything that Southern California has to offer. But LA is also the plastic capital of the world. <laughs> so I was 21 years young, 3,000 miles from home, little professional skills, you know, didn't have a good strong relationship or, or friend network. You know, very candidly, I didn't have fitness in my life. Candidly, I can't say that I was, you know, morbidly obese, but I was 20 pounds of body fat overweight, had very lean muscle mass on my body. And uh, ultimately, you know, being honest with you, I had more dark days than good for the first couple of years. Sure. And um, thankfully, a fortuitous situation a good buddy of mine that I went to college with, still friends to this day, moved out to Southern California. We decided to live together. And after a couple months, which I'm still embarrassed to admit, finally took uh, you know three months to muster up enough courage to say, hey, Adam, can you show me a little bit about this fitness thing? And a little bit about, about Adam, he wasn't on the cover of Men's Health, but he could have been. He had the six pack abs, the glistening muscles, the energy, the confidence, all the girls you know, looked up to him. And, and I certainly looked up to that. Well, he said, Bryce, I'll definitely you know train you, but you saw how many guys at college asked me to lift weights and how many actually stuck with it, like virtually zero. So I need a 12 week, 90 day commitment that you're gonna train what I want you to train, eat what I want you to eat. And after that period, 
if you're like, hey, this isn't for me, no worries, but I don't wanna waste your time or my time for that matter. And I was like, dude, that, that's great. What he did over really a period of two years, but really hyper-focused uh, about six months, he introduced me to circuit training, to lifting weights, to mm -hmm. clean nutrition, um, but most importantly, uh, coaching and accountability. B, what he really did is he showed me Fit Body Bootcamp before Fit Body Bootcamp existed. Sure. This is about early 2007. After going through that transformation, I dropped 20 pounds of body fat, put on you know 20 pounds of lean muscle. And that's substantial, by the way, 20 pounds of body Body fat dropped and 20 pounds of lean muscle put on, like you've completely changed not only metabolism, but how your whole body looked. Totally, yeah. You know? And it's interesting, um, my weight actually um, stayed the same. I was 175 and I finished 175, but I just drastically changed the body composition, yeah. which again is what we teach at Fit Body Bootcamp and the results that we provide. But after going through that transformation, yes, I got the physique, but way more important than that, I got confidence, I got energy, enthusiasm, assertiveness, and it really just changed my life. And um, But it wasn't until about a year later when someone walked up to me at the gym and said, hey dude, he introduced himself, I've been seeing how you lift weights, like how do you eat, how do you train? And this light bulb went on like dude what if i can actually give that back gift gift of fitness back to other people and one thing i didn't mention during that transformation i actually went from the lowest performing sales rep in the company to the highest performing sales mm. rep in the company so dude people you know still to this day like bryce i can't afford to get fit i'm like my friend you cannot afford not to get fit it's go. gonna change your life your vibration your frequency so i did what the most logical thing i could do is i enrolled myself as a certified personal trainer took the course for national academy of sports medicine and I think shortly after that, I updated my Facebook profile, the certified personal trainer. Had no idea what I was doing, but I started receiving ads from this guy named Bedros Koulian, who's hmm. sitting next to me right here, uh, talking about how to launch a fitness business and how to grow and scale and provide more impact and income to your community. And um, so I followed along. And um, you know, we just shot an episode on direct response marketing, started learning some of those concepts. And um, then you started talking about this little thing called Fit Body Bootcamp, which mm -hmm. was a licensee program but at this point fast forward a couple years later I had this awesome life adventure moved to South America for a couple of years met my wife Tatiana which I'll tell you about in another episode and uh, in 2012 when I started paying attention a little bit more to your email content you're talking about this franchise system that we're just basically evolving to and at the time it was a different landscape uh, not nearly the amount of owners in the brand but I did all the diligence I could I put in the expressive interest talked to as many owners as I possibly could finally back in the day and this is like summer 2012 was able to schedule a meeting with you at HQ. Um, nowadays, like with the size of our franchise and scope, that's not necessarily so easy. Uh, but within five minutes of meeting you and you know understanding the vision of Fit Body Bootcamp, I was like, dude, I want to partner myself with this guy. I want to partner myself with the Fit Body brand. And it was off to the races. And uh, really high level, you know, certainly had a lot of success, scaled to five locations. You offered me a VP role, which turned into a CEO role, which I guess I'll touch upon. I'll never forget end of November, uh, end of the year, November 2012 was when I launched the, the Orbelinda location. And we just shot a a video on episode on recession and basically at that point like got tons of rent abatement we just off the heels of the recession so I was able to attack that but within a, fur a handful of months it opened in a very bad time for fitness November you know right after Halloween right. Um, and then also my mindset was like January 1 the flood dates were gonna come well no that doesn't happen actually in fitness it's usually like a three-week delay so I remember scheduling a meeting probably three months into my journey and I was freaking out I was like hey the needles not moving and you know like a great coach that you are sat down kind of understood where I was at, gave me some marching orders. But one thing you noticed, and I still had my side sales job at the time, you're like, dude, man, like, are, you know, I'm gonna give you these action steps, which I took action on, but he's like, your focus is split. Like, are you serious about, you know, growing and scaling your business? Because if you are, you need to consolidate your attention. Um, so that was really good, good feedback. And uh, off I went, you know, over the next 120 days before our next mastermind meeting, uh, ended up taking all the action. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about this yesterday in the boardroom. I turned to my wife, Tatiana, about six months in. I was like, holy, Holy shit, this is actually working. My business is blowing right. up in front of my eyes. Yeah. So that was one key moment. The second key moment made a, a couple years later as I expanded to multiple locations, brought my wife, my sister, my mom, my brother into the fold and had a couple other locations at the time and got the invite uh, to share some of my success at the uh, um, Fitness Business Summit, which is a rager of event that used to put on uh, for over a decade. 
Um, so that was a key you know, indicator in terms of um, tapping your coaching and then basically showcasing the fruits of that coaching by helping other owners. And then as you just story told a bit in 2018, when the brand was hockey sticking, you had the vision to reach out to me and I'm still grateful to this day to offer me the VP role, which then ultimately turned into CEO mm -hmm. role as you patched the torch. So you can kind of continue to expand the empire and I have met uh, eyes on the day-to-day uh, -day operations. Uh, so it's been a wild ride and a journey, but I shared that with the audience and I share this with you today because there's three incredible points that I really want to drive home my takeaways from the summit. And I know B, you'll have more. But number one, if you are serious about your success, if you're serious about business growth, impact and income, you have to freaking stop dabbling, stop with this split focus Bingo. and go all in. Bingo. The most successful owners in our, in our brand, they freaking have a singularity of focus. They go all in. And that's a huge takeaway for you as a business owner, a fitness owner, a fitness business owner, and potentially a future fit body owner. Um, the second aspect of that is the relationship with time. And I'm a huge uh, advocate of Stoic philosophy, as you know, and it's interesting. People will, will squander their, their, they'll be so guarded about their financial situation, like literally don't, you know, so scared to throw a dollar in the marketing engine, but they'll give their time freely. Mm -hmm. Time is the only unrenewable asset you have. Time is the most precious thing you have. So if you're interested in, not only interested, you're committed to scaling, growing a business empire, you need to protect your time. You need to freaking time collapse. You need to hire a coach as I hired you who's gone where I want to go can see around corners and you know I'm a smart guy I'd like to think I would have probably got there but if it's gonna take me five years to get there or if I can hire a coach and get there in 12 months you're, that, that makes a ton of sense. So the second takeaway I have in the value of a coach, the value of a fitness business or a coach or even a franchise system um, is the ability to time collapse. And the third um, which is just a foundational principle that served me well is um, friends, uh, there is money in the transaction. There's a lot of transaction, billions and trillions of transactions that happen every single day. Um, but while there's money in the transaction, there is wealth in the relationship. Yeah. And uh, what I've learned and, and, you know, very fortunate to say this, um, but um, I became a millionaire in my mid thirties, multi-millionaire age 37. Um, and certainly I put a lot of work in, but it was a lot of guidance. It was a lot of relationship building. And uh, what's the famous saying? A rising tide raises all ships. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fact that there's money in the transaction, but there's wealth in the relationship. And really what that means to you as a business owner is having a strong network of people, having strong coaches. And certainly if you're fortunate and interested, uh, having a strong network of fr franchisees, um, business coaches at your, your disposal, that what, that's what moves the needle and that was the message that I shared at the opening keynote which I really want to articulate to you and man I was super grateful to have the opportunity but also man just being there for the f for the first day I mean I'm still jacked up and that was a few weeks ago so what's up my friend Bryce here now you might know me as the co-host of this podcast and the CEO of Fitbody but what many people don't know is that I actually began my journey as a Fitbody franchise owner. Now, being an owner, I wake up every day absolutely doing what I love. I live my passion, I help people transform their lives and have both financial and personal freedom. And it's for these reasons and many more that other owners join the brand and open their own Fitbody locations too. So if you're looking to build a highly profitable business, take charge of your life and create an impact in your very own community, then opening a Fitbody gym might be a perfect fit for you. Now to see if a territory is available in your area, as we have very limited spots due to our incredible growth, go ahead and visit our website at fbbcfranchise.com to complete an application. Well, thanks, and back to the show. Yeah, you know, when, when you go to an event like that where everyone shows up with the same intention, you realize how powerful proximity is. Oftentimes, in most of our day-to-day -day experiences, you go to the grocery store, you don't pick and choose who's in the grocery store. So you don't know if the person in front of you in line is in a negative state of mind and they're huffing and puffing and you know, muttering underneath their breath about how the things are expensive and this isn't right and they should keep the store cleaner and you know, why this and why that. And so your proximity affects your energy and your state of mind. And so we talked earlier about like the number one thing that can take a person off their trajectory of success or help them time collapse towards their success is input. Input, the information that comes into your head. Input comes from two places. The people that you surround yourself with that are around you, your proximity, and the thoughts that occupy your mind. Well, 
the thoughts that occupy your mind is probably the easiest fix because if you're constantly on a cell phone, on an iPhone, and you're screen sucking and watching bad, scary news happening in the world, that's negative input. You can turn that off. But if you're in a place where there's negative people that are energy vampires, time vampires, just constantly pessimistic, always operating out of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, then you soon will start operating out of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and the conversation in your head will be negative. And so when input is negative, then your belief systems are that, gosh, the world is doomed. If my belief systems are that the world is doomed, that's going to impact my actions. My actions are going to be, what's the point of taking any action mm -hmm. if the world is doomed? And therefore, I end up literally creating an environment of failure and going, see, the world was going to fail and this is proof of it. So we always find what we're looking for. And so if you can change the input, the thoughts that occupy your mind and the people you surround yourself with. So if we surround yourself with awesome, high energy people and then the limit the negative input and instead start following people on social media that actually add value to your life, get you to think at a higher level, get you to think bigger, get you to squash negative self-talk, then your belief systems all of a sudden go, you know what, I'm capable of anything. Mm -hmm. And a man or a woman that's capable of anything is willing to lean into massive action with a positive outcome. And all of a sudden the outcome is like, wow, I'm making more money, I'm in better health, I have a great relationship, uh, I have amazing friends. See that the world is good. So really input is a driving factor. And so when you're in a room of 300 people that all have the same intention, showed up with the same intention to level up, it really is a riding, rising tide that raises all ships. And so the big takeaways from the weekend that the audience ended up giving us feedback on is that we talked about how fitness is the gateway drug. And it's, you know, people go, well, why are you, all your businesses are kind of always hovering around fitness, whether it's Fit Body Bootcamp, True Lean, Fuel Hunt is kind of fitness gear that you could wear street gear right? Fuel hunt. Everybody wants to eat, but fuel will hunt. Um, it's back into, again, taking action. The reason I'm so big on fitness is because it is a gateway drug into better finances. If you want to change, have a positive change in your life, you can go right now. Bryce can go and have an awesome workout and his body's going to release endorphins and all the happy hormones and chemicals. And you're going to be like, you know what? The world is a good place after all. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, Hey, I'm going to go and try and change that guy's life or his mind, and he doesn't want his mind to be changed, you're like slamming your head against the wall. You're not gonna be able to do that. So the life that you can change is yours instantly. So I always say fitness is a gateway drug because when you start getting more fit, instantly the happy hormones, the endorphins and dopamine hits that you get, you start thinking more positively. You start having more eye contact with people. Your self-esteem and self-image, uh, they've measured it. People walk into the gym with lower self-image, walk out of a gym after a good workout with higher self-image. There was a study done on 10,000 people over a three month period on, in the same gym and they would ask them questions, but they wouldn't tell them what those questions are to decipher. And basically they deciphered, okay, this person's self-image right now is at a four out of 10. Then they would ask them similar questions on the way out. And that person that was a four out of 10 was now hovering like at a seven or an eight or a nine out of 10, a higher level of self-image and self-esteem. How crazy is it that one workout can do that? One That's good wild. workout can do that. Yeah. And so if one good workout can do that, you stack a lot of great workouts and all of a sudden you've built this new level of confidence and you go, well, gosh, if I could have this kind of routine of consistency in my life, I bet I can apply this in my relationship and maybe fix my broken relationship. I can probably apply this level of commitment and habit and consistency and focus into my work and make more money. I can do this as a parent and become a better father or mother. And that's why the fitness factor is a gateway drug. And this is why Wes and I constantly lean into change your fitness first, right? Change the shell because your body is a direct representation of what's happening in your head and your heart. And if your head and your heart are in a dark place and you're anxious and you're depressed and you're not having the most optimistic thoughts and the world is dark and gloomy, you can very quickly change that through a great workout. That's one thing. The other thing is, how do you stop a man or a woman who constantly goes to the gym, works that hard, like goes to battle with themselves and their inner demons every single day, when they face any kind of adversity in relationships, in life, because death happens and and unfortunately bad events happen, um, economic disasters. Those people that go to battle every day and work out hard 
are more likely to deal with the unfortunate situations of life. Totally. Better, right? Totally. And so that's why we stress the fitness factor first. And we found that if we stress the fitness factor first, it kind of bleeds into other areas of their life. So, you know, everyone was like, hey, I'm going to dial in my fitness first because I could only help others to the point that I can help myself. Then the other big takeaway that people shared over and over again was I should choose purpose over pleasure. Now, all of life has been designed through these goofy little apps that we have where we can order our food and what you can order the perfect hamburger or burrito from your favorite restaurant. And then using Grubhub or or some kind of Uber Eats, you could watch it coming down the street to your house. We've gotten so comfortable, so convenient based that we have atrophied our mental and emotional muscles. And we're like, ah, oh, can that light turn green so that they can get my burrito to me? Like there was a time that the caveman, cavewoman had to go hunt for their food, man. And if you're gonna pick that apple, that saber tooth tiger is gonna fuck you up, right? Not only even a time, man, I mean, granted the saber tooth tiger analogy, but like the vast majority of human existences, that's actually humanity. It's yeah. just the 10% sliver that we're that's living it. in freaking comfort. That's it. 50 years ago, people were waiting in line at grocery stores and questionable whether they would get food or not yeah. right and so the fact that now you can order custom order your food and watch it like down the street and know what intersection the burrito was stopped at and you're just like willing for that green light shows you that we have gotten so complacent in life because comfort and convenience leads to complacency and what we need now more of is discomfort and so people need to lean into more purpose-driven stuff less pleasure pleasure is all about comfort and convenience purpose is all about hardship because if I do hard things in life I will have an easy life if I do easy things in life I will have a hard life because if I'm constantly bubble wrapped emotionally and mentally, if people are always solving my problems for me, if food is always showing up at a click of a button, then when hardship comes, I am not equipped to deal with it. So purpose over pleasure, like we as humans are on this planet because we are meant to serve others. Everyone knows that when you go to a soup kitchen and you help people out, you know, pour soup for homeless people, afterwards you feel better. Mm -hmm. Or when you go and you go, you know what, I'm gonna go help this group who's cleaning the side of the highway, keep my city clean, afterwards you feel better, mm -hmm. right? But if you stayed at home in a dark, dank room watching another Netflix episode of whatever, you're like, gosh, I feel useless. And then that's how we start sliding into despair and then hopelessness and anxiety. And so if people can just start stacking purpose over pleasure. It's not to say that you shouldn't have pleasure in life. You should, mm -hmm. but have a level of purpose first. Go do the hard things first so that the easy things are a reward versus a point of complacency. And then of course, the third big takeaway that people shared with me about the High Performance Summit was that we all have some traumas because all of life is suffering. That's just a stoic philosophy. All of life is suffering with brief moments of bliss. That's mm -hmm. just how it is. Guess what? Every single one of you are going to die. That means you're going to make somebody very sad. You're going to have, you're going to cause a very, very bad moment, mm -hmm. period of time for someone. And in fact, their death is going to make you sad. Mm -hmm. So if we know that all of life is suffering with brief moments of bliss, then we know that we must be able to be more resilient where suffering is concerned. And so that big takeaway, the third big takeaway really was in addition to fitness being the gateway drug, purpose over pleasure, to be able to go out there and serve others. Like the person that shows up with the servant heart is able to add more value to society. And you have a greater sense of significance and fulfillment. But the only way you can serve more is if you first heal. And so if we know that one out of every three people, uh, when I talked about this on stage, like I saw eyes bug out, I said, well, the reality is statistically speaking that we have 300 people in the audience. We know that one out of every three people has been physically or mentally abused. One out of every four people has been sexually abused. No matter if you've been physically, mentally, or emotionally abused or sexually abused, the part of your brain that lights up is the fight or flight part. 
That means you're always fists up, you're always building walls, you're always wearing a mask in terms of a false identity, and until you feel your authentic self, you're never gonna rise to the occasion to serve humanity because you haven't even served yourself first. You haven't shown love and compassion to yourself. You haven't given yourself, shown kindness to yourself. And so what if we actually started to work through our traumas and realize that that trauma was not a punishment by God, it wasn't that you're a lesser human being, whether it was physical, mental, sexual abuse, it was just a very unfortunate fortunate thing that happened in your timeline of life. And if the average human is going to live, let's say a hundred years, if we're all given about a hundred years on this planet or 80 years, 90 years, whatever, that one experience, the negative experience to taint that happened in a period of time to then taint the rest of your 80 years of existence and the impact and the service and the contribution you can make is so sad. Ooh, travesty. Yeah. And so if you take your timeline and you take that giant mountain that looks like a mountain on your timeline, you're like, oh, like in my case, I was molested. I openly talk about the fact that between the ages of four and six, I was molested by two older boys. And so that put a lot of shame, rage, and confusion within me, right? And so when you're in a state of shame, rage, and confusion, you don't trust people. I wear these masks of, I'm okay, I'm fine, everything's okay, but really it's not. I was a scared boy as a grown man. And so until I worked with Kevin, our therapist, and, and did the self-work and the healing, I I realized that mountain on my timeline is actually just a tiny little blip of many, many years of helping humanity. And so some of the greatest work you can do in terms of serving is to be able to serve yourself first by healing through your traumas and then finding other people that you can serve and really becoming the lighthouse. Every single one of us could either be a lighthouse or we could be a tugboat. Um, because both the lighthouse and the tugboat do the same work, mm -hmm. right? Uh, tugboat will either push another ship towards shore or pull another ship towards shore with lots of effort and slamming into them very violently and tugging along. Or a lighthouse will just sit there and they will shine their light and the ships come to the shore to light. I don't want to be a tugboat in life. I want to be a lighthouse. I want to heal because the more we heal, the more we transcend to our higher self, vibrate, going back to that word, vibrate at a higher frequency, the brighter our light shines and the more we can attract and serve and heal. And then in life we go, man, you know, I have this great sense of fulfillment and significance, like I, my, my life meant something. And that's where you wanna be instead of, I want my life to mean something, but I'm too afraid to go out and do something because I'm still not healed. I'm still the broken little boy. I don't know what to do. So I'll just be anxious and stressed and overwhelmed and uh, deal with this through uh, alcohol and drugs and, uh, and, and infidelity and pornography and vices that take me down this rabbit hole of despair. It's so easy to go either human animal or human being. It takes the same amount of effort. The difference is one involves healing and one is leaning into vices and addictions. I always say, head towards the healing light. It's a much healthier place to be. Amen, man, holy smokes, that's a bow. And I think, you know, really to kind of put a bow on this episode, um, this is really not only to download you know, the High Performance Summit, but it's really teach you about mindset and personal growth. At the end of the day, you are the lid on your business. That Your business will only go as far as you go. So from a personal growth, a leadership development perspective, this needs to be a constant effort towards your life in order to create the income and the impact that we want you to have. So uh, B-Man, great episode. Anything else to add before we wrap for today? No, one of the greatest things I can tell people is you ought to read the book by Napoleon Hill, Outwitting the Devil. If there was one big takeaway from this episode that will make you a better entrepreneur, better husband, better father, better mother, better leader, better human being, start with that one book, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill, and let that book be the first domino in your personal growth to transcendence. Thank you, my friend and friends. I know you got a ton of value. Give us a like and subscribe and drop your biggest takeaway from what we just discussed in the comments. We'd love to engage and we will see you in the next episode.